Maloon is coping extremely well with this drought. Despite it being the driest six months on record, Maloon Farm is doing a lot better than other properties. The paddocks may look brown at the moment, but underneath the surface, the soil is alive. If you want to see how to beat the drought, the answer is less than one hour from Canberra. Let me tell you the simple miracle of Maloon Creek. There's no water flowing into Maloon from upstream, yet there's water flowing from Maloon downstream. All we've done is reproduced what was a natural process in Australia's landscapes. We've been able to get water into the floodplains, which sustains the landscape in a drought. We can fix all this, that's the good news. And we can do it quickly. And we can do things on our farms where we don't have to rely on the rainfall all the time. We absolutely need this. Otherwise, we will not be able to hand anything but a continually eroding, destroying landscape to, our, to the future generations. The success of Maloon is a testament to a moment in time when two giants of Australian agriculture came together and met. Tony Coote and Peter Andrews are going to go down as giving Australia its greatest gift ever. They've shown farmers not only how to survive during droughts, but how to thrive. My property, uh, Maloon Creek Natural Farms, is uh, about 6,000 acres between Canberra and the coast. I've had this farm for about 40 years. Over this period of time, we've shifted from conventional agriculture to doing everything totally naturally. I could see that no matter how well you managed your land and how good a farmer you were and whatever methods you used, that you cannot do it unless the land is hydrated. Peter Andrews can look at a landscape like a musician can look at a piece of music. He can read how the water flows and how the whole system works, how to slow it down, how to still the water, how to let it uh, soak into the banks to hydrate the land all around it. Tony was inclined to say, I want to make a legacy because I believe the world should know about this. And he just put every bit of effort he could into it to uh, achieve that outcome. Tony Coote approached Peter Andrews when he was in a horrible drought in 2006. But for Pete, this story began decades before when he realised that there was something fundamentally wrong with the landscape at his Tarwin Park horse stud near Bylong. Peter's passion was always his race horses and, and getting them to run as fast as they could. And he realised he needed the perfect original Australian landscape to make that happen. When uh, Dad purchased Tarwin Park, it was a highly eroded, salinised landscape. He set about repairing the degraded flow lines and making sure that he got the right amount of plants in there that could start to build the system. Within only a couple of years, Peter turned Tarwin Park into a flourishing, productive and vibrant landscape. What Peter's natural sequence farming does, it rehydrates the landscape. So put simply, you get the water back in the land like it used to be prior to colonisation. I saw that for land to go through a drought, you had to have reserves of water somewhere. And there were shapes in these sediments in the floodplains 
which proved that they worked like a series of giant sponges that filled up and they trickle fed the rest of the system through the dry periods. And so I said, well, let me see if I can do that. Maybe I'll fill up a floodplain and see what happens. The first thing he did was tried correcting the constantly eroding creek. So he brought in a bulldozer and he battered the banks down and he built some structures in the creek and planted willow trees and reeds. Certainly a lot of the neighbours were a little bit worried that he was taking all the water by blocking it up in the creek. They call in the, the authorities quite regularly. He used to always get phone calls from the departments saying, what are you doing? Quite often they just come out here. And, and um, I know there's been, there were, I remember lots of heated discussions with neighbours out the front of the house, people concerned about what he was doing. He was using weeds when we're spending billions of dollars to get rid of them. He was planting willows when you get government grants to take them out. He was planting reed beds when people thought you pull them out of swamps. Everything he did was contrary to what everybody was being told by the authorities. And this created an enormous atmosphere of fear and mistrust. He was seen as the heretical bloke up the valley, the nutter who wouldn't listen to anyone and who just did his own thing. What Peter did was to hold the water back, not dam it, not prevent it from moving, but to slow it down so that the, the, the water, the wet paddock remained wet. Water's filling the hole. Stage one is to get the erosive processes out. The results that I saw when I got to the farm for the first time on that first day was clear indications of the beginning of a recovery of land which had clearly was severely degraded. Once you get the hydrology right, this grass mix will stand five months yeah, or more. That. That's fantastic. So that's five centimetres of soil formation. I go over farmland all across the central west and you never see soil being built, you see it being degraded. I think it's the most significant uh, contribution to landscape restoration that I've seen in Australia. If you go to the properties where Peter Andrews has been working, those properties from the air are green. The neighbouring property is brown. Up to three times a week, he would go down to Sydney, knocking on people's doors, going to meetings with businessmen, trying to convince them that this was the way to go. He would sleep in the car and do it all again the next day. And then he'd come home. Quite often, he'd only be here for a few days and he'd do it all over again. He did that for years. Oh, that's the problem, you see. You guys have been too long in the city. <sighs> looking at the, the fish couldn't live in these rivers the way they are. There's no water. We've drained it all into the sea. Look, if you have any doubts, I'm quite happy to take you anywhere in the landscape. Worldwide, we've got destroyed landscapes. It was looking after itself until humans got involved. Why can't we recognise that? Stupid. I mean, it, in, if it were not preventable, then I wouldn't mind, but it is completely preventable. Tony Coot uh, realised that he had to do things differently to what used to happen on the farm. But having um, he heard about the work of Peter Andrews, uh, they um, embarked on a uh, sort of pilot project on about three kilometres of Maloon Creek uh, running through the home farm. I've been kind of put in you know, a couple of big rocks just up in, on this ledge here, at the back of this there. They flatten out the big well, Tony was a very successful uh, businessman in the jewellery industry at uh, Angus and Coote, but uh, he always had a very strong connection to the land. He bought his first piece of um, what's now Maloon Creek Natural Farms uh, yeah, back in the late 60s. We've brought the MG up from Sydney and Daddy's having a little zoom around. The bull's about to charge you, Daddy. When we were kids, we thought it was just normal for our creek to be way down there with cliff sides on both sides, like a drain. The condition of the land on my property, it was a deeply eroded, incised channel 
up to 10 metres down into the cut into the landscape with very little vegetation around it. His style of management when he was in the retail business was very much a big picture type of guy. So he was very good at seeing what had to be done and finding the right person to do it. It was so degraded that we put six truckloads of blackberry canes in the creek to trigger the fertility. Now it's growing its own fertility. It's got to a stage now where fish would love to live there. Every bird wants to go there and the frogs are all singing, they're happy. The results, we could see it within one year, with, and that was during drought. Uh, when we got a bit more moisture, uh, it, it was extraordinary. We have seen a 63% increase in the production on the hydrated land. We've seen drought proofing when there's no water coming in at the head of our valley. There's always water flowing out the bottom of the valley. We've got fish back in the stream that have only been seen in the upper reaches of national parks, and they thought they disappeared. I'm quite passionate because I can see that it, that it works. Dad had been obsessive with seeing what he could see in the Australian landscape and getting that out and proving to people that it worked. But in doing so, he lost sight of the core business, which paid the bills, which was the farm. And so as a result, we got ourselves into financial difficulty. The bank foreclosed on Peter. Thankfully, his son Stuart was able to buy Tarwin Park off the bank. But because Peter had so much emotion tied up with the property, that caused a huge rift between father and son. And it was just horrible to watch. It certainly created tension between Dad and I because he didn't, you know, he didn't agree with all the decisions that I was making and how I was running the farm. He was a dictator from almost day one. He wouldn't listen to me and many of the most critical parts failed under his management. In the end, it all came to naught. He just had the property going great guns and it was taken over by a coal mine. A Hunter Valley family renowned for its revolutionary farming practices says they've been given no choice but to move on. The owners of Tarwin Park near Bylong say they had to sell up to a Korean mining company because all their neighbours sold their land. I reckon it's the greatest disaster that uh, could happen in anyone's life. Yeah, I'm not one to cry, so I won't, but it's a bit upsetting, yeah. It was a huge blow to the family. That was his living laboratory, which he had constructed, unique in the world, over a period of about 30 years. His entire world was just imploding on him and it was hurting everyone close to him. My first reaction was, what a tragedy. But then I thought about it a lot more and realised that what Peter Andrews has been able to discover from the landscape and read from the landscape can still be translated into the future. The only consolation we've got is that now for 12 years, Maloon Creek has been rumbling along and turning into its own environmental powerhouse. Tony established the Maloon Institute to test regenerative agricultural practices. Dad's methods were at the forefront. It's about the same level as last time. It's just a little bit saltier. Dad realised that if you're going to roll this type of thing out across Australia, it has to be completely foolproof. And so that means that the data has to be collected very, very accurately. We've done multiple bird surveys, fish surveys, aquatic invertebrates, fauna survey, you know, all Everyone, every sort of thing, we've been getting base information. We've got really good structure in the soil, roots all the way down, and that, that's a good at least 30 centimetres. It doesn't matter if you can see that grass is growing on this side of the fence, no grass there. You've got stock fat as fools on this side of the fence, 
stock are dying of starvation there. None of that matters to government. You've got to have the data. Yeah, it's definitely That's one of the greatest achievements of Tony Coote. In 2013, Tony offered me a job to expand the original natural sequence farming demonstration out to the whole catchment. Hi, Peter, how are you? How are you getting on? Pretty tough one, isn't it? Yes. Bought water in, first time ever. It was my job to work with another 20 landholders in the catchment across an area of about 23,000 hectares involving well over 50 kilometres worth of creek. This will be one of the sites where we'll be building a structure in October. So it's still planned for October? I know that there was a little bit of scepticism from neighbours further down the creek. Bring the water level up about 700 millimetres. That was where Tony's skill as a communicator came into being because you had to have the person who was able to draw those people in. Well, we've had a, a long association with Tony and a, have a huge respect for him. That's probably part of the reason that we were inclined to, to join. But we also are wanting to do what's best for our property as well. This is Marlene's place. These yellow icons are where the structures are going to be built into the creek in October. And then we move further downstream into Jerry's place where these structures have already been built last March. Yeah, wow, look at all this growth, Jerry. This, this only went in here, yeah. less than six months ago. Yeah. This is brilliant. This is what we had in mind when we committed to the program in the first place, yeah. yeah. A lot of the local people were quite sceptical, you know, about the great news is a lot of those people have come on board over a period of time as they've seen the evidence of, you know, what this, what, what, what it does. We're going into the spring now. All of this vegetation is just going to spring up yeah. and it's going to armour this structure. Yeah. Within a few years, hopefully, we won't see this structure anymore. It'll just Absolutely. become It'll be like part of the Tony's. system. It'll be like Upper Tony's yeah. place, yep. Yeah. The fact that all the neighbours have now signed up, that now gives a model for this to be rolled out across Australia, where all the catchments can be done in the same collaborative way. You have to have community involved. You have to have the people involved in the land for it to go ahead. And that's what we are able to do, using Peter as the architect for that whole thing. And the way it, you can define it is as the floods rise, these patterns emerge and disappear. You're really saying it's like the whole landscape is covered in grass and under that landscape is water. It's the same as when you look back. Sometimes, you know, Peter was ready to go off on a bit of a tangent on a cause somewhere. Tony seemed to have the ability to sort of drag him back to a bit of reality at times as well. It's rubbish. <laughs> Peter gets extremely frustrated at foolish decisions and he gets very, very angry. The other thing. I be very severely criticised. And he can see things that others can't see. And it does get people offside because he tells it like it is. Now just stop, take a breath, look at the science. Tony was tolerant, he was able to listen. I think we trusted one another implicitly. So we'd be looking at putting... In business, from which I had, I've had quite a bit of experience, you, you work on people's strengths and you cover their weaknesses. To that. And that's what the Malone Institute project is to be able to make sure that Peter is doing the things that he's a genius at in a way that the whole thing can succeed for everybody. And it will, I can assure you that. Tony's determination to make sure everything was established uh, and set up uh, in a way in which he could approve before we lost him was, was something quite incredible. Tony, unfortunately, four years ago, he was diagnosed with, with cancer. He had um, bone cancer pretty much through a very large part of his body. It was amazing to me how he kept uh, without too much change until just the last few months. He was somebody that really didn't want to go yet uh, because he always had so much that he wanted to do. 
And unfortunately, it got to the point where it got into his vital organs and he, um, yeah, he passed away very, very shortly after. He had a vision and a passion for what the Australian landscape should look like. And my commitment is to see Tony Coote's inspirational legacy living on forever in the multitude of landscapes we will repair and rehydrate. Thank you. Oh, whenever you've had that long with a person of his type, you always miss them. I mean, there's, there's always a you know, void there, no matter how you look at it. Um, you know, we just... Some people you just don't replace. He lived on the land and with the land. So Tony Kurt, rest in peace, brother. Tony always had a very wicked sense of humour. And almost as a parting gesture, he was buried in a wicker basket made from willow. A bit of it was about a bit of an up yours to those who have objected to the use of willows in repairing degraded landscapes. We find it extremely frustrating and restrictive that government policy prevents us from being able to do what we need to do to restore our degraded landscapes back to the function that it used to have. The legislation that technically says that some of this work is illegal is clearly out of date legislation. And I think what governments really need to have a look at is to give the flexibility to allow this type of repair to be done. We could be doing a lot more work in that creek. It took something like two weeks to put all this stuff in place, but it took two years to get the paperwork through. And by the time the paperwork goes through, it's too late. For decades, every time I've seen any decision-making politician, I've said, go and check out what Peter Andrews is doing. And I believe Peter Andrews has visited your properties in the Hunter. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know Peter well. Why is it that we can't seem to get a federal holistic response? King? I can take you to 20 farms where people are not struggling. Can I just say to you, every property yeah. is different, you know, and it, and it depends a lot on your topography. There are different parts of the country where that's not, you know, that isn't as applicable. That's and, my and only point. I am so sick of politicians, of farmer groups and government agencies telling me, oh, Peter Andrews only works where you've got a little creek in a, in a mountain valley. That is an absolute load of crap. I've seen it work on flatlands, I've seen it work on steep lands. It can work anywhere. It's a little over two months uh, since Tony passed away. Good to see you. He was aware that uh, we were organising for the Prime Minister and Agriculture Minister to come out. Thank you very much. It's great to be out here. So it's, it's finally happened and uh, he would certainly uh, be very pleased. We've actually experienced the, 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 seven, uh, the seven driest um, yeah. months since the late 1800s. Yeah. And, but we've still got water trickling through the leaky weir mm. down here mm. of uh, Peter's Ponds. They certainly were impressed. So it's the vegetation, it's the, it's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, everything. it's great to have Peter Edwards here too. And Peter Andrews. Peter Andrews, Andrews sorry. Uh, to be here, who's the, been the, you know, the, the real leader and visionary behind the science. The Prime Minister was, uh, was very positive about uh, taking what he saw forward into uh, uh, government initiatives, particularly uh, government uh, investing uh, in, in this sort of work more broadly across Australia. This needs to be replicated right around our nation, a nation that looks after its soil, looks after itself, and, and it's the important work that you're doing here is a, a model to everyone. Great to see you, mate. Great to be I feel here. very confident that this is a real turning point for the future. Good to see you. Yeah, see you next week. Yeah. Right. I now live in the Mary Valley. We run our training course, Tawan Park Training, educating landholders in how they can utilise natural sequence farming on their landscapes to improve their productivity. The Maloon Institute invited us to do a series 
of training events with Town Park Training, and we invited Dad to join us as part of our team. So you put a stick across with mulch, hay underneath it. And this same scenario you could use anywhere. I was apprehensive about working with him, but that would be, <laughs> that's just normal, because I never know what to expect. After we'd finished the course, when we were standing there waiting to have the photo taken, Dad launched over to me and he put his arm around me, which I don't recall him ever doing before. Him putting his arm around me was not something that I was familiar with. And so he's not necessarily an overly affectionate person. And for him to show affection at that point, I thought was really good. It was a monumental event. Well, he's my son, of course, I'm proud of what he can do. Well, I'm not getting younger, that's the truth. Uh, and so I suppose um, I've tried to pass on the baton to a lot of people. Obviously starting to show a, bit, a few signs of the drought. Cause... Yes, it's all the water bodies are starting to drop back a little bit now, aren't they? But I do want to see the experience that I know is necessary. He becomes aware of before I get too old. I think you've probably got a few years left in you yet, though. I guess I've got a few more years to be tortured. Well, it should have done you good for now. At least it's got you doing something. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, certainly Tony was a great advocate of Peter Andrews and, uh, and his work. And uh, with his passing, um, Peter has lost you know, a wonderful supporter. But the legacy that Tony Coote has left behind and the, the people that are here responsible now to take his legacy forward are equally supporting. Tony Coote has shown everyone how he was determined his legacy was going to continue. He certainly set up something that could give the planet a very good future. His daughter Diana is going to assume his place on the board of the Maloon Institute. Where I can fit in is probably the fact that I really understand him and know, the, know what he values. My father used to always say that he believed that all farmers want to do the right thing by their land. I am optimistic for the future of our environment because I think that Australians really do treasure this land and, and know that we can do it. I had black hair when I started this process. It, it's turned me grey. This is our last chance to make something happen. If we don't do something now, we're going to lose Peter. And that's something that no amount of money or government funding or handouts can ever get back for us. I wake up in the morning and going, what are you doing this for? And then I'd go, well, who's going to do it? So like a deal, I'd keep on going and I've kept on going. Well, I just couldn't die believing I hadn't tried. That's the issue, I guess, so I'm crazy in that respect. <laughs> <laughs>